Hi, I'm Dave Schwab. Um, I'm a Glural alumnus. Um, I think that I am um, a longer, that, that when I started at Glural, there was only one person in this room that was already working there. So that um, I, don't, I don't think anybody can argue with anything that I say today, except George Leskovich. Uh, so what I want to talk about um, is one of the one of the what I consider one of the success stories of Glural. Uh, Glural has been around for 50 years now and has done a lot of amazing things. And I think what you're going to hear about during the day are um, some of the, the singular accomplishments of Glural. Um, the one that I've been in, uh, involved in, in in my 37 years there um, was uh, called the Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting System. Um, and I consider it a good example, not only of uh, a success story, it's also a story of how research gets turned into operations in NOAA. Um, and it's also a story of uh, the people that, that were involved in it, a story of something that Glural uh, has done well and still continues to do well, and I hope does well in the future. And that's this transition of research into operational products. Uh, a timeline uh, here goes from 1975 to 2012 plus. I noticed after I made this timeline, an overview of my talk, so that I split the development of the forecast system into five periods. And when you think about it, that's roughly five, 10 year periods during uh, the history of GLURL. Uh, the forecast system wasn't planned to be a 50 year project in 1975. Um, it was something that evolved over time, and I think it's, uh, as you listen to the way it evolved, um, you may consider it as a way that uh, 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 was designed, was, um, what do I want to say, programmed for success by being adaptable over time. And it's something that Glural, I learned, uh, was able to do within the um, government structure. Um, so 1975 is when I started at Glural, the year after the lab started. Um, at that time, we were uh, in a position to um, bring together some of the uh, science that was being done in coastal oceanography um, into the Great Lakes, into a, a long-term research program. Um, and I call that phase, that early phase of the development of the system, it's kind of pre Great Lakes forecast system, um, phase zero. Uh, the phase one is when we first really had the concept of uh, a forecasting system for the Great Lakes starting in 1988. Um, the second phase, the operational testing, uh, this, and or I should say the first phase also involved intimately uh, a connection with Ohio State University. So I'll talk more about that in phase, phase one. Um, phase two, the operations testing at, at uh, Glural is the phase when the university involvement diminished and the NOAA involvement increased as we became aware of what operations meant um, for NOAA and for the university. Phase three is when Glural started working with other parts of NOAA, the National Ocean Service, and the National Weather Service to move this system into an operational environment. Glural was a research lab, not an operations lab. Um, other parts of NOAA were the um, operational components, the Weather Service, the Ocean Service, and uh, the Satellite Service. Uh, and then phase four um, is the uh, current state of affairs, the operational implementation and continual running of, of this system. What is the Great Lakes Forecast System? Um, this is a, a, a statement um, of, of the purpose of the forecast system that I pulled up from 1988. And I was thinking, how can I update this to, to give us a current um, understanding of what it is? And I found I didn't have to. It was exactly the way uh, we intended it to be in 1988. The forecast system was a series of computer programs 
that automatically predict currents, waves, water temperatures, water levels in all of the Great Lakes. And back then in 1988, this was a concept. In today, it's a reality. It's unbelievable. How can you take something from 1988? And I'm so pleased to be able to come back here today and see it as something that, that actually occurred. Um, our objectives were to fully implement the system of computerized models that simulate and predict the three-dimensional structure of currents, temperatures, water level fluctuations, wind waves, ice, and sediments in the Great Lakes. Um, integrate these models into required observational data systems and into a real-time coastal prediction system. Um, and then make the data that was uh, created by this prediction system available in a useful format for the public forecasters and resource managers. So some examples of uh, things that happened during this period. Um, well, let's start with uh, phase zero, um, which we call the pre-development or kind of developing the prerequisites for this coastal forecasting system that happened during 1975 and 1988 at GLURL and at the Canada Center for Inland Waters, which kind of was kind of GLURL's sister lab in Canada, the Great Lakes research component of the Canadian Weather Service. Um, a lot of the early developments here, um, I attribute to um, people that were uh, previously in a, an academic environment, and now we're able to work in a slightly different environment in the government. The difference being that in the academic environment, you were often constrained in the type of project you could undertake by the duration of a research grant. You got a grant for a year or two years or three years. You developed a model, um, wrote a paper about it, and then started writing the next grant, which had to be different than the previous grant for it to get funded. So it was very difficult in an academic environment to do a project that lasted much more than two or three years. Um, now, these scientists, some of them listed here, um, John Bennett, Joe Simons um, at CCIW, uh, John Bennett was at GLURL, D.B. Rao at GLURL, myself, Mark Donilon at CCIW, Gabe Sinati, um, they were all came from academics and found themselves in this uh, different type of environment without a constraint of having to write a new research proposal. And there are different things that you can do in that environment than you could in the academic environment. Uh, one thing we learned at GLURL is that we could do um, some types of projects that might not necessarily result in a research paper in a journal, but we had a vehicle there at GLURL that was the technical report data report, sometimes called a gray literature, that wasn't um, necessarily through the review process of peer review process, but it was important to document developments that you made and have something you could reference as you made a long-term project like this. Some of the key ones that we did um, at GLURL had to do with an oil spill model, um, a wave model, um, some overwater wind analysis, um, and uh, Coast Watch was uh, uh, mentioned before by Debbie and, and Dave as a uh, involving satellite measurement of surface water temperatures was crucial in developing this forecast system. And uh, the, lastly, the uh, implementation of the Princeton Ocean Model, which was a computer model that was developed for the ocean coasts into the Great Lakes. Um, on the upper left um, corner here, you see some pictures from one of the data reports. It was a crucial step in the development of the forecast system. That was simply getting a grid that had depths in each grid square so that we could run numerical models of circulation in the lakes. This is something we, um, uh, the people that were involved in the early days had all done um, in academics by taking a piece of graph paper and laying it over a depth chart of the lake and have one person reading off the depth in each grid square and the other person writing them down on a piece of paper. 
Um, and <laughs> we got tired of that <laughs> after two or three lakes. So uh, uh, Diane Sellers and I wrote a technical report about a systematic way of digitizing the lakes once and for all on kind of a crude scale here. You see 10 kilometers grids for the lakes, but it was critical to do this to get going with numerical modeling. Um, the second thing we did was uh, um, in the center panel, uh, this is from uh, Julie Morton and I, uh, took data from IFIGL, the International Field Year on the Great Lakes, which was one of the few times that there were systematic measurements made simultaneously of the wind field at stations on land around the lake and wind over the lake at the same time. Um, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between those. The wind over the lake, as you probably all know, is not the same as the wind on the shore. And that changes depending on the season, uh, depending on the atmospheric stability. Basically, is the, the water warmer than the air or colder than the air? When the water is warmer than the air, there's a lot more uh, vertical mixing going on, and the wind over the lake can be much stronger than the wind over the land. Uh, when the water is cold, colder than the air, there's a, a stable layer that forms over the lake, and the air kind of scoots over the lake, um, and the wind at the surface of the lake is much less than the water over the land. If you've ever been out in the springtime on a boat, you'll notice that as further you go offshore, the lower the wind gets oftentimes. So Julie Martin and I took these uh, measurements and made some graphs simply of the uh, uh, ratio of the overland to over lake wind speed at uh, uh, different temperature regimes and different wind speed regimes. And this again was critical for uh, a critical um, development for modeling uh, circulation in the lakes because circulation is wind driven. You need to know the wind over the lake before you can get the currents right. To get the wind right, you've got to know how much different it is than land because there were no measurements of wind over the lake at that time, 1970s and 1980s. Um, the last panels show a schematic of the Princeton Ocean Model, which is another key development from uh, Princeton, obviously at MIT, uh, George Miller and Alan Blumberg there. And when they were developing that model, um, the difference between what we were doing at Glural and what they were doing was, uh, if you look at the wavy lines, in that cross section of a lake, uh, that's the coordinate system for the numerical model. And the difference in their approach to the uh, vertical modeling was that uh, the layers in the in the uh, vertical um, moved or were um, contoured to the bottom. So each position in the lake had the same number of vertical layers in the computer model. Thus, the vertical surfaces in the model followed the bottom contours and then were flat at the top. And this was critical for getting uh, the temperature structure right near the shores in the Great Lakes, something we couldn't do with the models we had. Princeton Ocean Model was the first model that could really do that. Um, on the bottom right is a picture of a box of punched cards. I don't know, raise your hand if you know what a punched card is. Not very many people uh, probably remember that, but that I put in there because that's how we got the first copy of the Princeton Ocean model. <laughs> and it was about that size, that number of cards. Um, you look at the names written on there are the names of the subroutines that are that are correspond to that section of cards. And just uh, aside, those slashed lines were drawn on many boxes of punched cards. And if does anybody know what the purpose of those diagonal lines were? It was so that you could tell if your cards were in order or not. If you dropped the cards and they got all mixed up, you could line up the lines to get them back in order. Uh, so phase one, how did the Great Lakes Coastal Forecast System get started? Um, in 1988, I had a conversation with a colleague at Ohio State, Keith Bedford, who was uh, uh, at that time the, the chairman of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Ohio State. And he said, Dave, I've got uh, a bunch of graduate students that um, want to work on PhDs, and they'd like to work on a big project together. 
uh, do you think it would be possible to do forecasts of circulation in Lake Erie on a on a day to day basis? And I go, you know, it's something that um, we had used as that concept we had used as justification for many of the research projects we did. We said someday um, it might be possible to forecast. That's why we're doing this. Someday it might be possible to forecast. Keith called and said, do you think that's today? And we talked it over at that time and looked at what we had um, accomplished in these prerequisite years. We had built a model with the Princeton Ocean model. Um, we had observations that we could get from the National Weather Service office at Cleveland in real time. At that time, the way you got something in real time was by a 300 baud modem, but we could do it. We could dial up Cleveland and download those observations. We had a computer that could run the Princeton Ocean model in real time that Ohio State was offering up their supercomputer, which was required at the time to get the model to run fast enough so that you could get a forecast done and still be ahead of, of schedule. Um, and we had uh, a coast watch working to give us the uh, pictures of the surface water temperature that we needed. So I said, yeah, it might be possible. Um, based on that conversation, we developed a flow chart of what it might look like. This is a flow chart from 1988, 1989, which again, looks very much like how the system is today. Are we near the end already? Oh my goodness. No, that can't be right. We have, I have till, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> we'll move quick then. Uh, uh, the lower right is, our lower left is uh, what a forecast cycle looks like. We split it into a now cast and a forecast. The now cast being the uh, hind cast, what you do is take the wind from yesterday, run the model and bring it up to current conditions. That serves as the initial condition then for making a forecast into the future using forecasted winds. And that cycle is the same cycle they use for weather forecasting. We applied it to um, lake forecasting here. Uh, important picture is that, well, we got the weather service involved, the GLURL involved, and the Ohio State graduate students involved. Those graduate students really were the backbone at that time of the first operational weather forecast or uh, O uh, coastal ocean forecast made for the Great Lakes on the Ohio State supercomputer. Um, the picture on the, the lower right there is the graduate students, Keith Bedford, receiving a special award from the American Meteorological Society for developing this system, that it was so unique back then, um, they were given that award. Uh, phase two operations testing from 1995 to 2003, this is where uh, the recognition was made that Ohio State could not continue to be an operational center for the system we had developed. It would have to be transitioned to NOAA, and GLURL started taking the lead on it. Uh, here's a, a picture from uh, 1997 with again, the, the students who had all now almost completed their PhDs and Keith Bedford and I, um, and Frank Aikman from the National Ocean Service. And one of the first pictures that was available on the internet at that time of output from the forecast system. Um, how was it transitioned into an operational environment? We worked closely, GLURL worked closely with the National Ocean Service, the Center for uh, Operations uh, uh, and Ocean Prediction Systems in moving that uh, system of computer programs over to the uh, NOAA central computer, central supercomputers. This is what the um, GLURL website looked like and the National Ocean Service website. Uh, the cool thing in the National Ocean Service is the Great Lakes are up there with the uh, coastal sites of Chesapeake Bay. Okay. Um, when do we become fully operational? Just in the last 10 years. Now this is kind of past my time. This is what the operational systems look like today. The GLURL system is still 
uh, running as a shadow operational system, showing the new experimental developments that are being made at GLORAL. Um, in summary then, the basic research on coastal modeling during the early years of GLORAL set the stage for the development of the coastal forecast system. The first forecast system in 1995 was a collaboration between Ohio State and GLORAL, um, NOAA, the National Weather Service, uh, and National Ocean Service recognized the need for this coastal ocean system for the Great Lakes. And now NOAA now provides that uh, as an operational system. GLORAL continues to be the center for research on this stuff. I want to thank um, all the people involved. These are the collaborators at GLORAL, Ohio State, uh, National Ocean Service, National Weather Service that had a finger in making this uh, possible. And it's been a, a real um, honor in my career to um, work with all these people and happy anniversary to GLORAL. <laughs>